So uh, beginning with the incursions into the Canary Islands in the 1340s, Iberians came into contact with a zone in the Southern latitudes whose features and inhabitants lay beyond the traditional European oecumenate. By the mid 15th century, Portuguese and Castilian ships plied the waters off of Guinea and Sierra Leone, occasionally ascending the African riverine systems and subsequently establishing trading posts, fetorias and colonies from the Cape Verde Islands to Sao Tome and beyond. The presence of Portuguese, Castilian and Italian merchants and mariners in West Africa from the 1440s on marks Europeans first regular direct contract, contact with the tropics. Although this chapter has been overlooked by comparison with the arrival of Europeans in the Americas, West Africa also represented a new world of sorts insofar as its features challenged so much of Europeans' geographical and ethnographic knowledge. Indeed, Iberian incursion into West Africa diverged in significant ways from medieval Iberian expansion in that it occurred in the torrid zone, the so-called torrid zone, a region about which circulated distinct ideas about climate and its determinative effect on human societies. Moreover, the fact that many of the inhabitants south of the Sahel region were not adherents to any of the Abrahamic faiths posed challenges to Iberian legal doctrines concerning just war, conquest, and the enslavement of people. The early decades of this Ibero-African encounter forced Iberians to wrestle with these questions of environmental or climatic determinism, the role of latitude in shaping human societies, as well as more ethnographic questions related to West African social structures, technologies, and matters touching on natural law and sovereignty. In the early 15th century, European knowledge about Africa south of the Sahara was founded largely on information transmitted from the authors of antiquity, little of which was based on autopsy. This led to erroneous beliefs about the size and extent of Africa and even its very inhabitability south of the Tropic of Cancer. During the 1430s and 1440s, however, Iberians' understanding of African geography underwent a dramatic revision. With royal sponsorship under the aegis of Prince Henry of Portugal, caravels pushed south along the Atlantic littoral, eventually reaching beyond the traditional boundary represented by Cape Bojador. In his chronicle of the discovery and conquest of Guinea, written around 1453, Gomez Eanes de Zurara represented the twinned landmarks of Cape Bojador and the Canary Islands as marking a gateway into the unknown. Zurara's narration of the exploratory journeys of the previous two decades, clearly meant to extol the part played by Prince Henry, the navigator, explains, quote, for up to Henry's time, neither by writings nor by the memory of man, was known with any certainty the nature of the land beyond that cape. Under Prince Henry's sponsorship though, Portuguese vessels pushed further south along Morocco's Atlantic coast. In 1434, the Portuguese mariner Gileanes rounded Cape Bojador, a feat that Zurada recorded as a defiant act of bravery. Quote, for, said the mariners, this much is clear, that beyond this cape, there is no race of men nor any place of inhabitants nor is the land less sandy than the deserts of Libya, where there is no water, no tree, no green herb, and the sea so shallow that a whole league from land, it is only a fathom deep, while the currents are so terrible that no ship having once passed the Cape will ever be able to return. Therefore, our fathers never attempted to pass it. In the early 16th century manuscripts compiled by the Lisbon-based printer, Valentin Fernandez, the author captures the sense of foreboding the sailors apparently felt, indicating that they plaintively asked, what good does it serve Prince Henry if we are entirely lost, body and soul? In another passage of his chronicle, Zorada recorded the ways in which Gileanus' 1434 rounding of the Cape defied expectations. In the sandy terrain beyond Bojador, the explorers discerned the footprints of people and camels. By finding these traces, the venture had ascertained that in a region formerly believed to be uninhabited, there were human as well as animal residents. This passage in Zurara's text makes a great deal of the discovery of the footprints, but the author no doubt overstates the degree to which this transformed Portuguese systems of geographic knowledge. The Catalan Atlas, uh, There we go. Um, the Catalan Atlas, which has been doing a lot of work today, I've shot up in a lot of PowerPoints. Um, the Catalan Atlas produced 58 years prior to Gileanus' sale, not to mention Masia de Villa de Villa 1413 Portalon chart, uh, 
And this is not as clear as the image from the Catalan Atlas, but you can see here that it reproduces a lot of the imagery of the Catalan Atlas. Um, and both of these um, maps or charts uh, represent extensive toponymic details about Sahelian Africa. And they demonstrate that some Europeans at least knew that the African landmass well south of Bojador was indeed inhabited, in the interior at least, if not along the coast. And after all, one of the principal motives behind Prince Henry's sponsorship of the Atlantic voyages was to gain direct access to the gold fields of West Africa, which Mediterranean geographers knew to lie south of the parallel on which Bojador lay. For these reasons, I think it makes better sense to understand Cape Bojador as a boundary due to the challenges posed to the mariners resulting from the extensive offshore shoals and contrary currents, rather than to an actual belief that the land south of there could not support human habitation. Still, even if Zurada exaggerates the extent to which Iberians in fact expected the terrain beyond Bojador to be devoid of human habitation, so little was known of those lands that they did constitute an epistemological frontier. And yet, one of the most striking elements of the early European accounts of West Africa are the descriptions of the region's emporia and commercial networks. In the markets of West Africa, numerous 15th century merchant writers noticed goods that had arrived there on the trade routes that connected the Sahel to the Mediterranean and Middle East. Writing in 1447 from the Saharan Oasis trading center of Tamentit and conveying information he had gathered about lands further south, the Genoese Antonio Malpante noted that the copper of Byzantium, which is obtained through Alexandria, is always in great demand throughout the land of the Blacks. In addition to Greek copper, Balfante recorded that the Egyptian merchants come to trade in the land of the Blacks with half a million head of cattle and camels. Malfante's host in Tamantit, who had lived in Timbuktu for 30 years and who still had a brother resident in that city, had apparently informed the Genoese traveler about the situation of Timbuktu and its connections. Malfante related that from what he could gather, Mali bordered Ethiopia, meaning here the Christian kingdom in East Africa. Malfante conveyed that Ethiopian merchants traveled to the markets of Timbuktu where they conducted their business through interpreters. Malfante's is a short letter, six pages in its edited form, but on several occasions he mentions his attempts, always in vain, to determine the source of the gold that moved through Timbuktu and along the Saharan caravan routes toward the Mediterranean. Alvise Cadamosto, a Venetian who sailed under the banner of Portugal, describing his first African voyage in 1455, was able to develop a detailed picture of the caravan routes that connected the northern and southern shores of the Sahara. He discerned that one trade route ran from Mali to Gao and from there towards Cairo and Syria. Another route, led to Timbuktu, then on to Tamentit, and from there on to Tunis, while a third led to Hoden and then to Oran, One, Fez, Arsila, and Safi on the Atlantic coast of Morocco. Um, not all of those sites are marked on this map, but here this does give you a sense of the Niger Saharan trade routes um, in their sort of sketched out in their sketched out form here. So for Cadamosto, Mali was wholly linked by multiple routes to various parts of the old world commercial networks with which he as a Venetian was already acquainted. Beyond the routes that led north from the Sahel, Cadamosto also describes much commerce and trade along the riverine systems of West Africa. The Portuguese sea captain Diogo Gomez, recounting a voyage of exploration that took place in 1456 or 1457, did not travel very far inland himself, but through the assistance of an interpreter, he recorded what he heard about the commercial center of Gao downriver from Timbuktu along the Niger. I understood there was a great abundance of gold and that caravans of camels and dromedaries traveled there with merchandise from Carthage or Tunis, from Fez, from Cairo, and from all the lands of the Saracens in exchange for gold. Recounting an exchange with Batimansa, ruler of a coastal territory to the south of the Gambia River, Diogo Gomez relates that the two were able to agree to peaceful terms apparently structured largely around a religious agreement and commercial exchange. Quote, he was pleased and extremely gracious, making merry with me and swearing to me by the one true God that he would never again war against the Christians, but that they might travel safely through his land and exchange their merchandise. The Lisbon-based printer and compiler, Valentin Fernandez, who composed his famous manuscript in 1505 or 1506, 
It's a compilation of several earlier written, written sources along with new information that Fernandez added based on oral interviews with Portuguese ship captains recently returned from Africa. Noted that at that time, Timbuktu was the center of the primary commercial network for the exchange of gold and salt, and that the city was the linchpin in a vast trade stretching from east to west across all of Africa. What is perhaps even more significant than Fernandez's discernment of the geographical extent of Timbuktu's trade is the way in which he characterizes the Mandinga people of the Mali Empire. Here he records, the people of this land are very disposed toward commerce and fairs. They travel to every town where markets are held. Another Portuguese, Rui de Pina, writing in the first years of the 16th century, likewise demonstrated an awareness that Timbuktu was a major center in the gold trade from where gold was transported north to all of North Africa and even to Jerusalem. Pina's patron, King John II of Portugal, desired to construct a fortress at the mouth of the Senegal River due to his belief that it was an artery that connected, a rivering system that connected to Timbuktu and Mombare. With Pina's description of Timbuktu's role in the gold trade, it is easy to grasp the monarch's rationale for this plan. Now, a thread running through the citations I draw on here is the understanding of West Africa, not as isolated or cut off, but as fully integrated into the wider commercial networks with which these Mediterranean merchant venturers were familiar. To be sure, there are elements of fantasy included in these sources that I cite here. A number of these authors, including Cada Mosto and Duarte Pacheco Pereira, for instance, describe the silent trade putatively practiced in West Africa. Cada Mosto acknowledges that he himself never witnessed this, but that he gathered his descriptions of this practice of a contactless trade of salt for gold through conversations that he had with other merchants, Arab and Azanegi. Modern research has dispelled this as a myth, and in fact, a carefully structured trading practice probably practiced by West Africans and intended to preserve a monopoly on access to and control of the gold fields in West Africa. Descriptions of this so-called silent trade go back as far as Herodotus, and Ali Drisi described it in the 12th century, so these later European writers are likely simply including this detail, parroting what they had read before, or including it out of a belief that it was necessary to include these canonical authorities. Um, and yet, in spite of the intrusion of certain elements of fantasy here, the 15th century writers I've mentioned do accurately capture the geography of the Saharan trading networks. In many of the particulars, from the routes the caravans followed to the goods exchanged, these European accounts accord quite closely with medieval Arabic accounts of West Africa, including those by al-Bakri, al-Idrisi, Ibn Battuta, and others. What is more, these descriptions can now be corroborated by the findings of recent archaeological excavations. For instance, digs at Gao and slightly to the north at, Ta at Tadmeca reveal an extensive Saharan trade in copper, just as Antonio Mafante attested in 1447. Glass beads excavated at Gao indicate extensive trade networks as far back as the 8th or 9th century, extending southwestward to Jene, north to Tadmeca, and beyond. And chemical analysis of the glass shows that much of it originated in Egypt. So in other words, based on these findings, we can reconstruct with a fair amount of accuracy the routes that the caravan routes followed. And Mamadi Dembale, an archaeologist based in Mali, has done this and describes the medieval Saharan networks as following three principal arteries. The first in the west ran through Walata and Auragust up to Sijilmasa. The second from Gao through Tadmeca up to the Mediterranean, while a third ran from Timbuktu up to Morocco. So the evidence furnished by recent archaeological digs supports much of what the 15th century Italian and Iberian writers recorded. Whether through their own observations or through the information gathered by interpreters, these Mediterranean writers conveyed a rather accurate picture of the commercial links that tied Sahelian and West Africa to the Maghreb and the wider Mediterranean. My interest, however, is not merely to demonstrate how accurate the reports of these writers are. Um, of much greater interest to me is the fact that we see in these accounts by Malfante, Cadamosto, Diego Gomez, Valentin Fernandez, Rui de Pina, and others, that these writers immediately situate West Africa into a European oikumene. This stands in stark contrast to the earliest representations that we read in Zurara of Bojador as a boundary demarcating the end of the known world. 
Indeed, the texts cited here demonstrate an extremely rapid discursive shift, <clears throat> one that appears to have taken place in less than two decades from portraying Africa south of the Sahara as the unknown, scorched by the sun, perhaps even uninhabited, to depicting the region as one of urban spaces, cities with populations in the thousands, fully integrated into the commercial networks Mediterranean merchants knew very well and where highly sought goods and commodities exchanged hands. By way of comparison, we should look at some of the same writer's descriptions of the Canary Islands. Calamosto, for example, writes, there is neither wine nor corn save what is brought there from other places, little fruit and almost nothing else of value. Following this disparaging assessment, Calamosto goes on to focus a great deal of attention, detailing what he determined to be the strange customs of the indigenous Canary Islanders. Like Calamosto, Valentin Fernandez spends a lot of time describing what he deems the unnatural customs of the Canary Islanders, their sexual practices, marital customs, and so on, but he makes no mention of commerce. Describing Fuerteventura, he laments, they have no gold, no silver, no money, no jewels, nor any other artisanal products. And then he moves on. These examples point to a real discrepancy in the way that Iberian and Italian writers described the societies of the Canary Islands and those of West Africa. David Abalafia, in his study, The Discovery of Mankind, Atlantic Encounters in the Age of Columbus, analyzes the degree to which 14th and 15th century uh, Europeans struggled to comprehend the novelty represented by Canary Island societies. These had been almost completely isolated for perhaps a millennium and a half, and their material culture reflected that fact. By contrast, 15th century European accounts of West Africa, south of the Tropic of Cancer, shifted extremely quickly from portraying these lands as possibly uninhabitable to depicting them as completely enmeshed in expansive commercial networks. And this points to ways that the West African theater of encounter was dramatically different than that unfolding contemporaneously in the Canary Islands or those encounters that took place in subsequent decades in the Americas. What accounts for these divergent paths? Well, one factor I think, obviously, is the European desire to locate precious metals, specie. In gold, West Africa had a product that Europeans desperately desired. And beyond gold, a European demand for slave labor also induced European merchants to try to gain entry into West African markets. Now, as, as my fellow panelist Deborah was just telling us the Canary Islands, of course, were also a source of slaves, but the European method of procuring slaves in West Africa was largely carried out through commercial transactions rather than raiding, with the exception of the earliest years. Those markets were controlled by African merchants and sovereigns, and these conditions placed European merchants in a position of not always being able to dictate the terms of exchange to the extent that they might have liked. In the second book of his Esmeraldo de Situ Orbis, Duarte Pacheco Pereira reveals an obsession with commerce. Time and again, throughout his narrative, he describes new peoples encountered along the coast of Africa, devoting a great deal of attention to whether they practiced idolatry, whether they were circumcised, whether there was a dense population, and whether they conducted commerce. If you're wondering what each of these criteria has to do with the others, I am too. Um, but um, he does seem to associate these. And he's particularly keen to describe places like Sutuco near the Gambia River, where they hold a great fair at regular intervals. These are the places that really catch his attention that he includes in this uh, text. But this association between idolatry, circumcision, and commerce is not clear. But for him, some recognizable marker of religious identity, such as circumcision, seems to increase the likelihood of good commercial relations. Further south along the Atlantic coast, Pereira describes people who are idolaters and are uncircumcised. Many of these people do not engage in commerce, or at least there is no possibility for the Portuguese to enter into commerce with them. And Pereira writes, they are evil people and there is no commerce here. Or just south of the equator, Pereira describes the inhabitants this, this way. The blacks of this land are all heathens and idolaters and not given to commerce. It seems that Pereira uses a number of various factors here to determine whether people can be classified as civilized, and these include religious identity, circumcision or lack thereof, and whether a people engages in commerce. <clears throat> the commercial aspect is extremely important for him. 
In short, Herrera provides evidence of the degree to which Europeans in West Africa were in fact seeking trading partners, illustrating the ways in which commerce served as a mechanism of coexistence, which is one of the ways that Tom was encouraging us to think about this for this conference, as a mechanism of coexistence for the Ibero-African trading centers along the African coast. This brings us to a point that Herman Bennett makes in his recent study, African Kings and Black Slaves. Bennett explores the relationship between trade and sovereignty, suggesting that the Portuguese desired commerce with African polities, and they early on recognized that to achieve that meant recognizing the sovereignty of the African lords whom they met. The African lords in turn appeared to the Portuguese to exercise a despotic form of sovereignty, one whereby they held the power to enslave and sell their subjects at their whim. Indeed, Bennett here gets at the tragic irony of this arrangement, that in a system wherein the Portuguese merchants recognized African rulers' to, uh, sovereignty, engaging with them in a variety of exchanges that Bennett reads as expressions of diplomacy, they did so in a commercial system based increasingly on the subjugation of African people and their enslavement and transport to far off locales. I don't intend to privilege trade and commercial interests here above all else in the early decades of these Ibero-African encounters. Iberians also attempted to impose legibility on African landscapes in a variety of other ways. Um, they conflated the Senegal and Niger rivers with the Nile. They uh, situated sites in Africa according to biblical geographies, creating gold producing regions with Ophir and seeking the terrestrial paradise near Ethiopia, which they associated with the kingdom of Prester John. So there are a lot of different ways in which they attempt to impose a kind of legibility on the African landscape. Um, in this matrix of forces, European recognition of markets that were already connected to the Mediterranean commercial system and a desire to gain entry into these trade networks does seem to have mitigated against conflict to have created a mechanism of coexistence. But there were other factors at play as well. Disease affected Europeans and Africans disparately in an inverse way than it did in the Canary Islands and in the Americas a few decades later. So there are a variety of factors here that I think sort of structure the kinds of diplomacy and the kinds of relations that develop from the 1440s on. Still, it is worth bearing in mind the fact that through their description of West African commercial structures, European writers rendered African space intelligible in ways that they did not in regards to the Canary Islands or to the Caribbean post-1492. Commercial exchange in West African cities and markets, the ability to procure desirable products and to find a market for European goods there, rendered the West African spaces to which Europeans gravitated legible in ways that the Canary Islands or the Caribbean were not. West African societies, while still being depicted as sites of marvel or wonder, as exotic in some ways, nevertheless were rendered differently than were the other newly encountered spaces of the southern latitudes of the Atlantic Basin. Thank you.